Welcome to the workshop. In this series of videos, I'm going to build a miniature of my Series 2 Land Rover. This is going to be based on a electric mobility scooter. I'm going to use parts from a garden tractor and I'm going to build a plywood body. I'm going to show you all of these processes in as much detail as I can. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for watching. In this first episode, I'm going to focus on the chassis, steering and suspension. So my first job is to ruin a perfectly good mobility scooter. The scooter I'm using is a Freerider Kensington S for sport, probably. I spent 500 pounds on this one and it's a very clean example. Hopefully this will mean I won't be plagued with electrical problems down the line. Most of the parts I'm removing will be sold to help fund the project. The only bits going back on are the batteries, wiring loom and motor, which on this model are particularly strong, but that is not the only reason I chose it. The general size and shape of the chassis and the wheelbase is bang on. The wheelbase of this is 88 centimetres, the wheelbase of my Land Rover is 88 inches. That means that all of the measurements I take from my real car can be translated onto this at a scale of two fifths. The first thing I need to do to this chassis is to raise the suspension by about three and a half inches. I'm going to start at the front because that's the easiest end. It's as simple as removing everything from the front axle, taking it out, turning it upside down and bolting everything back on again. It's that simple. This is the hub that goes on the driver's end of the axle. What I want to do before I fit it is modify it. I want to make this arm here a little bit longer so that this hole can sit about an inch further from the center. This should make the steering a little bit easier to control. So I need to make an extension piece. The idea is this is going to slide onto here like that, weld on there, and then the new hole will be up at about that sort of height. That's going to make the steering a little bit easier to control in the corners. That is my modified hub. Basically all I've done is I have followed the four original holes through. I've also added two at the top. This gives me two extra options of where I can bolt on my drag link, which links the two sides together. If you are doing this and you don't have the luxury of a welder as I do, what you can do is simply do exactly the same thing, but put a nut and bolt through holes four and two. That will basically do the same job for people who don't have a welder. With the tracking arm refitted in its original position, you can see that it's far too close to the chassis. To get round this, I'm simply going to bolt it on upside down. With the wheels back on, you can see that not only has the suspension raised up by the distance we need, but we now have a huge amount of extra movement in the axle. The rear suspension needs similar treatment, but for now, I'm just going to remove it so that I can extend the back of the chassis to include a very important Land Rover design feature. I'm referring, of course, to the rear cross member of the chassis with its distinctive angled ends, which I shall make from a piece of this steel box section. I'm scaling down the measurements from my car so that I can cut and weld the angled ends to match. I'm also drilling holes for a tow bar attachment, which I shall make and fit later on. There is my rather sexy looking rear cross member. What I need to do now is build a jig that mounts onto the frame and holds this in exactly the right position so I can weld it on. This is my welding jig. I know it looks complicated, but it's really very simple. It's basically just two levels running along the length of the chassis and I've used this suspension turret as a height reference point. This rear board simply holds the cross member in place while I fabricate some new chassis rails to go between it and the frame. I like to think that some people will be watching this because they're trying to recreate this project at home. Those people will want to know that the measurement between this surface of the battery tray and this surface of the cross member is 339 millimeters. Also from the bottom of the reference level to the top of the cross member is 12 millimeters.
Now next thing I want to do is start to build up the rear suspension and the first job is to modify the swing arm. As you can see, it pivots on these two bronze bushes, but it does not twist. So the first thing I'm going to do is separate these two arms so that they can move independently of each other and give a little bit of articulation in the chassis. This is one of my swing arms, as you can see, I've kept the bronze bush, I have kept the spring pickup point, and I've kept the axle pickup point. What I have done though, is move the axle pickup points back down the arm by 24 millimeters, and I shall explain why. To raise the rear suspension, I'm going to drop the swing arm to a steeper angle. This means shortening the wheelbase. Moving the mounting holes down slightly simply returns the wheelbase to its original measurement. But it is not quite that simple. In order to make my independent suspension work, the axle has to be able to twist on the swing arms, which means it cannot just be bolted straight on metal to metal. So what I have done is used some 10 millimeter thick modular floor mats. I have cut out four of these and they basically just sit between the two brackets and they allow just a little bit of twist so that the springs can do their work and the chassis can absorb some of the bumps. What I need now is a way of getting my swing arms to stay at their new height. And I'm going to use a pair of these. This is just a piece of 10 mil threaded bar with a 30 degree angle in it. There's two nylock nuts, one on either side of the bend, a large washer and another two nuts up here. Now the point of the other two is that the spring will then slide over the shaft like that and the two nuts just keep it located, keep it in the right position. This then acts as a spacer, basically making the spring longer and adding an extra inch and a half of height. I appreciate that this is not a very high-tech solution to the problem, but like its owner, it is simple and it's adjustable. This nut adjusts the ride height and this nut adjusts the spring tension. Next thing on the list is wheels. This is one of them, as you can see, it's the wrong color. It's light gray, Land Rovers don't have light gray wheels, they have sort of black, dark gray wheels. So, I have some new tires. Last job to do at the back is to cut a few bits off. First is the carrier for the seat, which of course is no longer needed. And second is the large bracket that held all of the electrical components. It's redundant and it's in the way. The tubes I've removed also acted as a separation point for the chassis. So I'm welding them together for obvious reasons. Back at the front, there's two jobs left to do, the bumper and the steering system. The bumper's the easy bit, so I shall do that first. There's my Land Rover bumper with its little miniature curved ends on it. This is going to go on the front like that. So now I need to fabricate something between it and the frame. Using four 10 millimeter bolts to attach a bumper to a child's car is probably a bit excessive, but the reason I like this design is because by adjusting these bolts up and down, you can adjust not just the height, but the angle and the pitch of the bumper. 
The original steering system for this chassis consists of this very simple lever design. Now, this is fine if you're using handlebars, but we're not. This is a car, cars have steering wheels. So, first thing I need to do is remove all of this so I can fit a different system. The system I'm using is from a Countax garden tractor. I bought this system on eBay, it cost about £50 and it's ideal because it's very compact and very simple. I've given it all a very thorough degreasing, but before I paint any of it, I need to modify this. This is the steering spindle. This rather scabby looking end used to take the garden tractor steering wheel. The problem is that's the wrong end and the whole thing is about 20 centimetres too long. So I'm going to cut it off here and I'm going to weld on an adapting plate. <laughs> The modified steering shaft, the quadrant and a few other bits are going to be painted, but they're pretty rough so I shall throw some sand at them first. With all of these bits ready, the next thing I need to do is find a way of attaching them to the car. And I'm going to use this piece of 2mm sheet steel, which needs to be cut to these measurements. Here are the measurements for cutting the adapting bracket and the bracket itself, which I'm bending to the right shape with my trusty homemade metal folder. There is my finished steering adapter bracket. This is going to go on the frame just here. I need to drill a couple of holes and then I can bolt it on. The new steering setup is simply a geared quadrant rotating on a steel pin that bolts to the back of my new bracket. The quadrant is turned by a gear on the steering shaft which spins in a ball joint mounted to the back of the bracket. At the moment, the steering shaft just wobbles around in its ball joint, and it will do until the body is there to hold it still. This fixes onto the chassis and acts as a temporary brace to hold the steering shaft in the right position. The final finishing touch is the steering wheel. I bought this online. These are available for about 20 quid from anywhere that sells go-kart parts. And that's it. That's the end of all the chassis work, and indeed the end of this video. Before I leave you, I do just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who has left such positive messages on my videos and all my subscribers. Your support just means the world to me. I hope everyone's found this interesting and I hope that you will join me for the rest of the series and indeed check out all of my other videos. So thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.